Hello Penguinauts, I'm the Billy Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal. Today we are completing construction of the Clark, our interstellar colony ship. So what we're doing here is sending the final shipment of material kits and specialised parts from Artemis all the way over to Tycho Station so we can actually finalise construction of the Clark on board of course our Merlin craft powered by that extremely powerful Zed Pinch fusion engine having to activate it after we're a minimum safe distance from Artemis yet again so using those aerospike engines just to get ourselves up to uh, a few hundred meters per second and then using the Zed Pinch to accelerate ourselves up into orbit but we've got yeah quite a long shopping list of things to do in this episode because I want to be going into Stella in the next episode that's right we're going to another star next episode but uh, we have a quite a few things we need to get done not only do we need to finalize construction of the clock but then we actually need to fuel the damn thing uh, and of course our crew on the morning star mission needs to actually return and then of course we need to send home the crew on artemis itself maybe give them a little bit of shore leave a bit of time off before we blast them all off with their families and go uh, all the way off to set up a colony around another star i mean every kerbal on solitude will eventually be sent uh, to our uh, colony destination, but uh, it'll take quite some time. This is going to be an expeditionary mission, hence the prefix IEV, Interstellar Expeditionary Vessel, which we're putting on everything that's going to go to Valentine. So you can see here the Merlin is just approaching Tycho, just getting ourselves docked. And yeah, this is the 15th shipment of material kits and specialized parts yeah it took uh, quite a lot of these things to actually construct this vessel so this is the final one kerman kerman our ever reliable pilot uh, is just delivering it and now our 12 engineers can get to finalizing construction but we're not going to actually release the clark yet uh, <laughs> release the clark no uh, mainly because with all the different craft on Tycho, it would probably crash my computer. So what we're going to do is actually uh, try and reduce the part count a little bit before we launch it. So we're going to send the Merlin all the way back to Artemis. We're actually sending four engineers back with it. Not the same four engineers that we actually brought from Artemis. They have been on Artemis now for 14 years. Uh, so we're going to send uh, Ben Kerman of course was the lead engineer on Artemis quite a while back and then he was sent off on our constellation mission to the wasteland for a bit and he's had a, a bit of shore leave back on solitude. Uh, we're going to send him and three other engineers back to Artemis because we need to have some engineers uh, so that we can actually refit the Merlin to no longer carry specialized parts and material kits but actually start transporting fusion pellets to Tycho because as I said in the previous episode, if we launched uh, enough helium-3 <laughs> to actually fuel the Clark from Solitude, it would bankrupt us many times over. I think it would actually cost billions of funds for us to do that. We're having to mine the helium-3 on Nemesis uh, and then actually ship it to Tycho um, ourselves. And that's going to take about three years of time just to mine enough fusion pallets to do that. And I think about 10 trips um, with our sort of refitted Merlin but that will be a little bit later in the episode. You see here, swapping back over to our Aerospike engine so we don't kill every single Kerbal in Artemis uh, with some rather deadly neutron radiation just as we're landing. And uh, we get all our engineers and Kerman Kerman inside and they're going to get to work on refitting the Merlin spacecraft. So as I said, we can actually fuel up the Clark once we've launched it. However, there are a bunch of resources which we can't produce on Artemis which we're going to have to ship up into orbit from Solitude. And that's what we're going to do now. Using a brand new spacecraft, this is the Guinevere. I don't entirely know why I'm naming all of our auxiliary craft after <laughs> characters from Arthurian legend, considering that our interstellar craft is not named after King Arthur, it's named after Arthur C. Clarke, but whatever. Anyway, this is a variant of the Zed Pinch engine, the Aerospike variant, which means as well as using an Aerospike nozzle, it also has a number of built-in air intakes, meaning it can operate very effectively in atmosphere, running off of intake atmosphere, and then once we get higher up into the atmosphere, we're actually going to swap over to onboard uh, liquid carbon dioxide very similar to the condors except of course we're using um thermal propulsion produced by uh 
but essentially passing propellant around the outside of a fusion reactor um, for the condors because they're going to need to be descending and taking off from colonies so we can't really have them spewing out deadly neutron radiation. Of course the space center here is shielded against it um, but our colony modules are not going to be. So although this engine is absurdly powerful and I, I really am falling in love with these Ed Pinch engines, uh, we're not going to be using them on our uh, craft actually going and uh, landing so we're actually going to stick with the thermal turbojets for the condors. It's a shame that they, they do produce so much neutron radiation, uh, but alas, they have to have some drawbacks, otherwise they would be absolutely brokenly powerful. And yeah, they really are powerful. You can see here we've blasted up into orbit. Not quite a single stage to orbit because we had some uh, drop tanks for fuel there um, just to get this up into orbit. But yeah, this is 300 tons of supplies, mostly fertilizer uh, to power our agroponics bays so that we can essentially farm our own food during the journey. Um, but also a number of uh, different resources such as glycorol so we can actually freeze uh, a lot of our colonists for the trip uh, and a number of various different things that we can't actually produce on Artemis. Well, we can produce fertilizer on Artemis, I guess, but uh, I just thought it would be much easier to launch all of this stuff from Solitude. As I said, yeah, 300 tons to orbit with a vehicle this size. Doesn't even have any boosters. So... Yeah, that shows just how ridiculously far our technology has come and just how powerful these Zed Pinch engines really are. As I said, I really have fallen in love with them. But now we've got the supplies up here, all we have to do is undock. And yeah, we're going to send this Zed Pinch engine back down to the surface. The Guinevere, I think it cost about 700,000 funds uh, to launch this thing. So obviously, yeah, we're going to be reusing it. I did notice once we were up in orbit, I thought about it. I thought, wait a second, uh, why did we just ditch those drop tanks on the side? Um, all I did was put nose cones on them and, and drop them. And of course, although they don't really cost anything, and we basically have infinite funds at this point anyway. Well, not infinite because we can't afford the Helium-3, but we have a lot of money. Um, <laughs> but there's no real point wasting them. We might as well make this thing 100% reusable. So yeah, for the next launch of the Guinevere, I actually uh, stuck some parachutes on those drop tanks. And using the stage recovery mod, we can actually uh, recover them as well. So we can essentially recover those side tanks, refuel them and stick them back on the next launch. We only need the drop tanks just because we are lifting so much stuff into orbit. I mean, I could have done it without the drop tanks, but it would, it would have required a third trip. And I wanted to see if I can get this done uh, in two separate trips. So here we go. We're launching again. We have a few less drop tanks, about half the number this time, because we're launching about 250 tons of supplies now. And it's mainly liquid fuel and oxidizer. Uh, Tycho does have some liquid fuel on it left over. Um, I remember we stuck the fuel module from, I think it was Reclaimer and Odyssey. Those are two of our interplanetary spacecraft from the uh, Endurance series. We just drained their excess fuel before we deorbited them and stuck that on Tycho as a, as a reserve fuel tank. We're going to be using all of that uh, on the Clark, but we need to have a little bit more up there. So you can see there a rather chunky ass a uh, five meter tank absolutely filled with liquid fuel and oxidizer. We also have a bunch of monopropellant and a few other things. Although the Clark itself isn't going to use monopropellant, it actually, since it is so unbelievably huge, and don't worry, you will see it uh, rather shortly, uh, if we need to use Werner thrusters to be able to turn it. So yeah, we're not going to be using monopropellant engines. They're just not going to be anywhere near effective enough. You can see here, we can't use the Z-Pinch engine um, too close to Tycho because of course we have Kerbals on board we don't want to kill them with neutron radiation so we're using Werner thrusters to actually maneuver but they're powerful enough we can use them to decelerate once we've actually got within um, load range and then we can rendezvous with them really rather easily despite the absurd mass of this spacecraft yeah I, this episode i really do fall in love with the with these massive Werner engines i've never really used them in Kerbal before mainly because i've never built craft big and heavy enough to actually warrant needing them uh, but since keeping part counts low as possible is really important with all these spacecraft uh, i think using some much larger much more powerful engines uh, is certainly going to preserve my sanity so you can see here just again just deorbiting the guinevere and uh, this one yeah it was a little bit more unstable i was trying to be sort of snazzy and uh, see if i was trying to see if i could do a propulsive landing would not have to use the parachutes at all um but with a bit of fuel still left in the front fuel tank it's a little bit front heavy uh, so unfortunately it was a little bit uh, aerodynamically unstable even with the grid fins so uh, we have to sort of use the parachutes to stabilize ourselves and then we can land slightly explosively with our engine but now we can finalize the construction of the clark and oh 
Isn't she a beauty? I spent far too many hours on this thing. Of course, I know we had a stream where I built it, but then I've been tweaking it to high heaven since. Uh, for some reason, releasing it uh, really messed up Tycho. I think we angered the Kraken with this <laughs> monument to Kerbal Vanity. Perhaps it, it got angered by that. Uh, so I decided to attack Tycho Station, but thankfully nothing exploded. And we can get some rather gorgeous beauty shots of the Clark in all of its glory. Twin um, spinning habitat rings there. Much, much larger ones from KSB Interstellar. And I did base it rather heavily off of the ship from the KSB 2 trailer, but it has quite a few tricks up its Leave, which I will be going over in detail in the next episode but I'll leave a lot of its surprises uh, and hopefully some of you can maybe work out what some of the more interesting parts on the spacecraft actually do but uh, I will go over more of its functions in the next episode but uh, hopefully that's that's wet the whistle a little bit uh, for when we actually do travel to Valentine next episode oh, it's uh, I'm so happy with how it turned out honestly it is gorgeous i'm unbelievably proud of it and some people on my discord have figured out apparently it actually breaks some records um in the kerbal community for like largest uh, craft actually built within career mode with an actual purpose that is i know some people have probably just launched ginormous fuel tanks into orbit but uh, apparently it does break some kind of records which i think is, is pretty awesome i did put a picture of it on the kerbal space program subreddit and uh yeah it went down really rather well i did put a jokey title uh which was <laughs> who needs kerbal space program 2 when you have mods and the overwhelming response was oh yeah my frame rate does beardy you can see here uh we made the mistake of accidentally draining the tritium from our reactors uh onto the clock because once you launch it it automatically just takes the resources out of the station that's launching it uh yeah and i accidentally drained the tritium out of our reactors so our reactors here are having to do deuterium deuterium fusion which doesn't produce anywhere near as much energy as deuterium tritium fusion so we couldn't actually slow down using our engines during re-entry so things got a little toasty and the bottom of the condor actually exploded so i'll have to fix that before we uh dock it to the clock and blast it to another star system uh but thankfully yeah nobody was actually in it all of our crew members are actually in the higher crew modules so now we've returned all of our engineers back down to the surface of solitude it's time to fuel up the clark so here you can see we used the four engineers that we sent over to artemis to refit the merlin i mean i actually just tore it down and completely rebuilt it from scratch but you know head cannon and all that and we're going to start shipping fusion pallets as i said this is going to take about three years to produce enough fusion pellets to actually fully fuel this thing. Uh, so it's going to take uh, quite a bit of time, but this is the first full shipment that our new module on Artemis has managed to produce. So once again, using those aerospike engines to just get ourselves to the minimum safe distance. And there we go, triggering the fusion engine, having to make sure it's on the correct fusion mode. It can actually operate in a pure fusion mode and not use any fuel apart from the actual fuel pellets themselves, uh, but it doesn't produce much thrust at all. And honestly, yeah, we, <laughs> we don't have to worry too much about specific impulse uh, and a specific impulse of 20,000 seconds is probably more than enough <laughs> You see there, just with that tiny little um, liquid fuel fuel tank, we can get all the way down to the same orbit as the clock and return all the way back again. So, yeah, we don't have to be concerned uh, too much about <laughs> optimizing our efficiency. Oh, we get another gorgeous view of the clock there. Honestly, I'm so proud of it. I'm embarrassingly proud of this spacecraft, but I think maybe I get a right to be considering <laughs> the countless hours I've spent on this thing. Um, but we're going to get a lot more episodes and a lot more views of it, and you'll actually get more of a uh, an idea of its capabilities and just how many countless hours I poured not in only into the actual spacecraft but all of the various different modules and everything we are sending with it I think docking this spacecraft to it you get a sense of the actual scale of this thing obviously I had to use a hangar extender many of you saw me build it in episode 13 uh, which was live um, but yeah just getting a sense of the, the scale of this thing um, docking this refueling spacecraft to it uh, it really is a sight to behold ah just soak it all in i mean my computer was running about five frames per second this is sped up to six times speed i believe uh, and even then you can see it's it's going rather slowly this docking maneuver surprisingly though it does actually run better than artemis does i think that's just because artemis has so many ongoing processes and you know, it's refining and manufacturing so much stuff so even though artemis is half the number of parts as the clark um maybe perhaps it's on a, because it's on a surface maybe it requires a bit more but anyway artemis actually lags 
a bit more than the Clark does, which is reassuring really, because I, I did worry that the Clark might not actually even be playable. Uh, but it turns out it's just about the same amount of lag that we had to deal with uh, with some of our larger craft back in Kerbal Rising, so nothing I'm not used to already. So now we've deposited our first load of fuel, we're going to head on back to Artemis. Yeah, you're going to be seeing a lot of Nemesis and Artemis <laughs> in this video. Um, yeah, I didn't actually even intend for Artemis to be quite this central to all of our plans, but yeah, um, it's really, really worked out. I mean, I only originally built it just sort of as a blueprint for building USI colonies because I'd never done it before. And, you know, we made a bunch of mistakes and had to ship up extra modules and stuff to balance out all our production chains and tweak it to uh, finally get itself sufficient. I'm so glad I did build it just for that, just for the experience and actually learning how to make a self-sufficient colony in USI because USI is like a whole new game just by itself um, but it's had so many other uses and made the game so much more uh, so much easier for us so I'm very very glad that we actually have it so now we've got all that sorted and we're gradually fueling up the clock it's time for Morningstar to return home it's got about three years of time to return from the outer edges of the solar system we're doing our sort of correction maneuver here, just correcting our inclination and getting ourselves on an intercept with Solitude. And then our crew can finally return home. They will have been out there for 20 years. Yeah, uh, two whole decades out in space. I mean, even the scientists have only been conscious for about three years of that because that was they were kind of limited by the amount of supplies they had and more importantly the amount of fertilizer they had so they could actually produce their own supplies and they are completely out hence why we had to <laughs> we had to freeze them um, for the remainder of the trip um, which is a bit, a bit of a shame because they still have loads of data in those science labs um, but unfortunately we just we just didn't have the supplies for the scientists to continue researching them but uh, this is still carrying a lot of science reports. I mean, we've got science reports not only from Reaper and each and every one of its moons and all of their services, but also from Eltos, because some of you guys actually, you know, did a little bit of napkin math and, math and said, hey, Beardy, you know, you could probably make it to Eltos and back as well. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you listen I listened to you guys. Um, you can see here, though, that, yeah, we, we cut this fine. We don't actually have all that much fuel left. So thank goodness we put a refueling spacecraft um, actually on this mission so we could refuel around Reaper. And also, thank goodness we left the Mustang um, and everything, and all the dead weight, essentially, uh, back in Elto's orbit, because otherwise we would not have actually been able to make it home. But now the morning start is in orbit, we're going to send the IEV James Corey back up into orbit. Yeah, it's going back and forth quite a bit. Um, we're going to use it quite a lot before we actually send it to another star. And yeah, it's not as powerful uh, as that Z-Pinch engine, but honestly, when you're just lifting crew to orbit and back, you don't need an engine as powerful <laughs> as the Z-Pinch. Uh, or as massive and unwieldy as well. I mean, that one engine is pretty much the size of this entire spacecraft. Uh, so <laughs> we certainly make things uh, a little bit more compact as well using these uh, these thermal turbo jets instead. And you see there, just floating up into orbit. We've pretty much got this ascent profile nailed. So I was very happy with this one. We we docked within one orbit, uh, which is something I was, I was uh, rather proud of. <laughs> We can see there, just heading back onto it. I think we've got Lemor Kerman, who's uh, actually one of our five-star Kerbals, uh, heading onto orbit here. Heading up to meet the only other five-star Kerbals, actually, that we have. Just going all the way out to Reaper, immediately leveled all of them up to five stars. So, yeah, it's going to be quite important to have all the crew of Morningstar on our interstellar mission. Uh, of course, though, we are going to give them quite a bit of time off before we blast them into space again. Then we have just over a year at this point um, until our Valentine transfer window. I mean, we don't actually have to wait for a transfer window. We can blast off there whenever we want. But if we wait till the optimum launch time, it will shave a couple of months off of the journey time. So we might as well. And yeah, uh, when we unfreeze these Kerbals, they've got to be pretty shocked. I mean, they've they've missed out on 20 years of technological advancement. When they left, I mean, they, <laughs> the closed cycle nuclear engines they were using, fission engines, were the pinnacle of our technology. And now they're waking up to find a single stage to orbit fusion powered spacecraft <laughs> there to pick them up. So, of course, they've received you know, tidbits of information uh, and, you know, transmissions while they've been awake and while they've been out there. But for the most part, they've just been working hard and then 
going straight back into cryonic sleep again. So this has got to be quite the shock, having essentially the welcoming parade be this massive fusion spacecraft and literally being told, yeah, uh, you've got about a year to uh, recover and then we're blasting you off to another star system. But surely it's got to be rewarding that uh, all of the scientific data that they've procured has really, really helped to advance our space program. I mean, the Morning Star and Constellation missions are the reason why we have com almost completed the tech tree. Um, without those science labs on those missions, yeah, we we wouldn't be anywhere near finishing the tech tree at this point. Some of those KSB interstellar tech nodes require such an absurd amount of science. I mean, the late game, the late tier ones require 20,000 science per tech, which is just insane. <laughs> Considering how powerful the engines and reactors and everything actually are that you get out of it, I guess it, uh, it sort of balances out. This time, of course, we actually have tritium in our reactors, so we can do uh, deuterium tritium fission, which, not fission, fusion, which produces more than enough power for us to slow down so we don't take any damage on re-entry. And this time, I thought I would, I would take the opportunity to show off a little bit because, of course, I put a lot more research and development into the Condor, it's actually going to have to land on a lot of planets, so it is aerodynamically stable, so it can land propulsively. And I decided, yeah, let's show off. We're not going to use parachutes, we're going to land with just our engines. And uh, yeah, sure enough, we manage it, and uh, I was a little bit smug managing that first try. Hell yeah, it works. I mean, it's probably something we wanted to make sure we had working before we, you know, send it to another star system. But you can see there, everybody's level 5, and we get over 30,000 science <laughs> returned from all of those reports, which is enough to get a single tech node. Uh, thankfully, it's really the only tech node we had any more use for, because it's the last tech node that actually upgrades any of the tech we're using. I believe it upgrades, uh, yeah, those um, thermal generators and also the one fusion reactor that we're using on board the Clark and its various colony modules. Although we have already built the Clark, so I don't know if the upgrades get applied. Uh, I might have to check that out, but even so, it doesn't really matter. One upgrade doesn't make that much of a difference. So now all we have left is to send home the crew from Artemis. During the intervening three years it's taken for Morningstar to get home, they have finished fueling up the Clark and everything is ready to go. It's, it's almost a shame to see Artemis now being all shut down, decommissioned. Artemis has been continually populated for 17 years with one crew or another, which is just crazy. Um, it's a testament to, you know, our self-sufficient colony design. Um, but it's a very old colony at this point, but it has been absolutely absolutely vital. It's basically been a core piece of infrastructure in our entire space program, uh, at least for this entire series so far. Um, it was responsible for the Endurance and of course the Bifrost Array which powered the Endurance, which is still in orbit, although uh, we don't really have any use for it anymore. Um, and of course it produced all of the parts necessary to build the Clark and actually produce the main fuel for the main engine of the Clark. So. Yeah, uh, as I said, I, I built it for completely separate reasons, but it's turned out to be really, really useful. It's all come together really well, um, and I'm really just quite chuffed with how it's all turned out. Um, but these Kerbals, at least the ones that have been there for 17 years, not the four engineers that have only been there for about three years um, since we put them on there in this episode, yeah, I think it's about time they went home. <laughs> but it was very important that they actually tested all of our colony systems for a long, long time and actually made sure that we could make a self-sufficient colony. There's also a colonization meter, uh, which each planet has. If you have colonist kerbals and colony modules on a planet, a Terry surface, for, for enough time, it gradually colonizes it. And if you get to think about 500% colonization, hab timers of all the kerbals on that planet don't go down. It essentially becomes equivalent to a home world. Um, and we got to something like 470% colonization on Nemesis, which is a barren piece of rock. Um, so that's pretty crazy, and it shows that actually, if we make the colony self-sufficient for enough time around this other star, for only about 20 years or so, um, then we won't even need colony supplies to keep our Kerbals happy, which is just crazy. Uh, the Artemis... Uh, the crew did actually bring one last load of refined exotics back with them in the Asteria there. 
Uh, which gives us about 7 million funds. Not that we really even needed it at this point, but yeah, you might as well if you're, <laughs> you're traveling back from Artemis. If we brought back a much smaller load of Helium-3, though, it would have actually netted us a lot more money. But anyway, everything is now ready and prepared for the next episode, where we will be blasting our crew up to the Clark and sending them to another star system. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Hope you're so, ex <laughs> so excited for the next episode like I am, and I will see you all next time.